thank you very much for coming to my session. I know there's a lot of very interesting one going on. So um, just a quick intro. I work for a company called Marsh McLean. It's on. It was on. Try it again. Test, test. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. OK. Oh, should we good now? Try again. Can you hear it? Okay, good. Yay, okay. All right. So, yeah, I work for a company called Marsh McLennan. They're one of the biggest insurance brokers, and we do a lot of cyber broking business, thousands of companies. Probably about 70% of the global 2,000 we broke for them. Um, I wanted to talk today about navigating the changing cyber uh, environments. And um, quick intro, um, talk to you a little bit about the data and talk about the different trends that we're seeing. Uh, you probably see a lot more um, graph and statistics and stuff. I build a risk model for a living, so uh, <laughs> you're going to see a lot more different cost components, how long does it take, and what does the price look like, so on and so forth. So um, I'm going to go through some of those including privacy specifically to business interruptions and as well as some of the ransomware trends and how many people are paying, not paying, just give some of those types of statistics. In addition, also, um, there's area that's rising to become a pretty big risk, and that's something that we should consider. And then um, the last but not the least, how to improve the odds using what we do for research. So go from there. Uh, data source. So the data source that I have based on this presentation is sideway loss data flashpoint, uh, any of the public reporting such as 10Ks and so forth, some of those large losses coming from 10Ks. Um, also all the Marsh McLennan claims. So Marsh is a U.S. brokerage business and then also the, some of the UK European claims that we have as well as the insurance portfolio. Marsh McLennan has a company for, called Guy Carpenter. Guy Carpenter does broking for all the reinsurance brokers. So all the insurance portfolio, those type of, uh, in, when the portfolio have claims, we also import those data. So um, I want to keep the majority of the data from 2017 to 2024, depends on the peril because like for ransomware, it didn't really start till 2019, so I start 20, counting on 2019 on. So that's how. Um, uh, the first part is trends and statistics. So this is a uh, set of cyber events, around 116,000 events from incidents from 2017 to 20, April of 2024. I should, not 2023, I, I see a mistake now. I didn't catch this one. But um, that's how many of those. Um, in the current environment, uh, one of the things that uh, everybody's worried about is aggregating risk. Third party risk is top of the mind. Uh, some of the common vulnerability, hardware, software, like the cloud strike thing. Those are things that this is actually a slide that was generated toward the end of last year. <laughs> so. We had like common software hardware and that was already there. And sure enough, we were worrying about that and that came out. Uh, the common dependen dependencies, uh, digital suppliers, they all depend on one another. Um, we had about 60% 60, 60 of the company has over 1,000 suppliers that they work with. So partners and suppliers. And of course the geopolitical stuff and in the privacy regulation, this is a new area that um, didn't used to see as many claims as we do now. Uh, GDPR fines definitely gotten a lot more popular. Uh, and then the alphabet soup of the uh, lawsuits, CCPA, BIPA. Uh, the first jury trial of the BIPA was the settlement was 44 million. The second one that we saw was 1.4 billion for the mega pixel settlement between Facebook and state of Texas. 
So that, we also see a number of claims on that one as well too. That's starting to come up as well. Uh, pixie tracking, that's also popping up a lot. And in terms of uh, data environment, uh, data encryption and BI are the two biggest uh, concern, and those are the generate the larger claims that we have seen. Uh, so compromise, if you look at our um, claim rate, about 80 some percent of those marsh claims did not have ransomware, but still there's almost 88, 90 percent, and from quarter to quarter that number goes down one point or another, but there's still a whole bunch of them. Uh, we definitely see more of the fraudulent fund transfer stuff as well as other kind of things that we're seeing. Uh, supply chain, that's definitely become a hot button as well. Good news, the rate's going down. <laughs> you can see all the, all the rates uh, in terms of per, you know, uh, starting 2022 used to be really high. It's going down a lot, but that means a lot of our clients actually are increasing their limits and um, uh, reevaluate their, how do they want to uh, invest in risk management stuff. Uh, opportunity to look at see what are the cost of risk to them and if they can use the extra money to just increasing the list and then you can see the primary layer and the, the total price both went down a lot uh, I don't know how the cloud strike events gonna affect so far we have as of Friday we had about 143 claims from that one so it's getting pretty high <clears throat> Again, this is a slide that I created a while back. <laughs> and sure enough, that's the, you know, I added the cloud strike thing. I have everything else on there except the cloud strike thing. So uh, widespread events, zero day vulnerabilities. Zero day vulnerability on 2023 has becoming a pretty, um, that's what drive everything down because privacy event have gone down, but except uh, 2023 jumping up again due to zero day stuff, the clouds, Microsoft Exchange, Move It, uh, Move It had about over 2,000 organizations that's affected. The Cisco event, as well as Cloud Strikes, about 8.5 million Windows device, and there's going to be many more of those things. So, and if you look at the incidents worldwide, you can see U.S. still number one, Canada is number two now, and Great Britain is number three, and then India, this is just an event count, not frequency, this is just an event count. So, but U.S. tend to have the highest frequency, and this is, if you look at the U.S. itself, um, 2017, it's in general still increasing. Uh, 2023 is probably partial data. We had about, the U.S. incident itself has about 60, more than 60,000 events from 2017 to April 2023. Uh, 24, why can't I say? 2024, I'm, I think that one was one of the things. So that should be 2024. So that's, uh, that we can see that in 2024 data, it's uh, totally partial. So you probably get less than a quarter of data on 2024 for that little thing on the bottom of the side. <clears throat> in terms of cyber incident by industry, you can see that um, healthcare being the highest count and then after that is finance and insurance and public administrations and those are all increased. You can see things are increasing in the green, which is the information system stuff, as well as the manufacturing starting to increase in terms of, uh, we see a lot more uh, ransomware event in the manufacturer sector now also. So this is the next chart. This is a ransomware. The other one, the previous one is just um, all cyber event privacy, everything, uh, business interruption, and as well as ransomware. So, but if you look at uh, ransomware, uh, manufacturer being the number one in terms of count, and then uh, professional services like account, accounting firms, law firms, those are getting hit pretty uh, more frequent now. It used to be they're very small. If you look at the 2019, they're a little band right there, but it, it comes over, it's almost twice as much as what it was before. So you can see how they evolve in terms of industries. <clears throat> um, here's one of the things that we were playing with. Um, we want to see how 
what are the things causing the from the cyber event that caused the business event? So if you look at it, you can see that uh, network breach, uh, almost majority of it is coming from either extortion or privacy breach. And this, we just ran this for the retail industry. And as you can also see impersonations, it get a lot of theft of funds, most of those type of event. And then system degradations goes to business interruption event. And that's how we saw of all the event percentage, how they came in, and then where did it end up? That's so it's a good indicator. All the existing data going for bridge response, um, the data average is right around a million. And so um, the 99% pot tile is about 57 million. So uh, you can see where things land. In the 50% tile, one out of two is almost a million dollars. So the average and the 50% tile come very close. So um, legal. <laughs> This is one that everybody keep asking me, how much is legal? How do you model legal? What, what are the things legal? So legal on an average, data average, is about $4 million on what we're seeing. And the 99 percentile is about $266 million. So legal is a big chunk of uh, uh, cost in terms of cyber event. Because even if they don't breach your data, even they just touch the data, you still need to talk to legal counsel to say, what are the things that I have to do to be compliant? So there are things that you're going to have to do. So that's what the legal costs look like. Data recovery. So data recovery on average is about $2 million, uh, based on the data that we have, uh, tw up to $26 million on the 99 percent tile. Um, this could get to be quite high depending on what kind of data. So if you are an engineering firm, um, your, all the blueprints got hacked and taken away, so then you have to build a project, you have to start all over again. Those kind of data would become very expensive. Uh, if it's you know a set of customer type of data, um, it could be expensive, but you don't have to build everything from scratch. It depends. So this might range quite a lot. Um, so in case you had an incident, how long does it take for me to get over it? <laughs> so uh, the median in terms of detections, two days. Uh, containment's pretty quick. But analysis take over a month. Notifications and discoveries and stuff like that take about two months. And then the average on the detections it's a little over a month to detect it. And uh, if it's a network intrusion, it's also 36 days. Uh, containment, containment's about four to five days. But yes, you can see there's very varies on here. This is from uh, Baker and Hostler, one of the DSIR reports that they have. So it's kind of interesting to see how, um, what a difference between median and average, which means that there are a lot of company recover, detect it very quickly, recover very quickly, but in general, it will take a while, over a month to do the analysis and notify your customers and so on. So, so I'll dive into privacy a little bit more and privacy I go back a little further because the data in general takes a long, takes a long time for those cases to close. Some of them from 2019, 2018, those are still open. Those cases are still in litigation, so I kept data that's longer. Uh, privacy, in terms of privacy risk, um, data is still a pretty big component of it. This is of all the most impactful cyber events. Uh, we saw 2022 got a little less, but 2023, due to the zero days, it jumped right back up again. Uh, data assets, uh, all the PII, PCI, all your proprietary informations, those kind of stuff. And it's important for you to categorize your sensitive data and stu store them accordingly. And also to decide, understand who has asset, access to those data. Because we had a claim that, uh, for example, as a partner, as a bill collector, and they had a data breach. 
It's a little guy bill collector, and um, they can't pay it. Whatever it is, the cost was too big. So they went out of business. Well, guess what? The company ended up with the bill. So they end up having to do all the bridge response, notification, everything else. So watch, look at the partner as well, who your business partner is. Make sure that that is something that you would want to think about. <clears throat> um, additional risk area, this is starting things that's coming up now, uh, biometric data. All those biometric data, BIPA, uh, HIPAA, <laughs> Alphabet soup of all the litigations all coming up a lot now. Uh, so the next wave of things that we're seeing is digital risk class that involving allegations of illegal data collections and sharing and um, all those collection of data because of the LLM model the, that it's hungry for data. You're collecting those data and sharing those data, building models for AI, those kind of stuff. We start seeing some of those kind of things coming to play. Uh, a megapixel pixel tracking also too, that's also uh, popping up quite a lot. Uh, tracking the customer's habit, especially the healthcare industry, they're complaining that they're collecting their pixel data uh, to, to, to uh, look at what kind, of, how, how, what kind of health issues that they have. So that's in lawsuits and stuff like that. So if you look at this, uh, the, this bigger household, they are defending about 300 privacy lawsuit type of case. About one out of every, you know, uh, there's a big amount of those claims. I can't remember the exact number. I think it's one out of every 100 claim uh, event has a privacy lawsuit. Don't, I have to think about that one. So here's to what we have. So in terms of Marsh, if you can see the last few year, uh, BIPA, you can see it's increasing from year over year, but the meta pixel, it gone from two to one to nothing to 12 of them last year, and I mean 2022, and then uh, 44 in 2023. So tracking of customer use, how they, it's becoming lawsuit as well. So, and then the BIPA claim, uh, Right now, a lot of those uh, lawsuits are pretty hefty lawsuits. So here are some of the large data losses. I, kinda, I updated this slide using more recent data. Um, my marketing took out the names. <laughs> Says, no, a lot of those are our clients, so we don't want to show it like that. So give her the country. So you can probably look it up, the dollar number, and look it up. And this is number of coming from either from the company financial report or from their press release, from their 10K that they files. And um, this is just what they disclose. This, a lot of this, I would have to say, many of this is only partial data. This is not the full loss amount. So you can see some of those could be, become very hefty. Uh, the settlement fines and penalty, um, this one's all public, it's everywhere. So I was okay to show names. So this is some of the big numbers. Uh, if you see the line two, that was the settlement from Facebook to the state of Texas. That's the $1.4 billion settlement for taking the, uh, uh, the BIPA information, biometric information uh, for Texans. So I don't know if we'll ever see any of that. <clears throat> So here's some of the historical uh, per record calls. That's another one that everybody's asking about. Uh, how much does it really cost me if I had a data breach? And again, this is what's disclosed. Uh, some of those numbers, I can guarantee you, some of those number is more than double what it is. They only disclose a certain amount. Uh, others uh, got away with, like Marriott, for example, they, it was 36 cents, that was right around 2019 that when it came up and they said, hey, nobody is staying in our hotel, we're not making any money, we can't pay this. <laughs> so it went down a lot, so I wouldn't expect that to repeat again. But um, if you go with the IBM's estimates, $149 somewhere around there per record. So I think that number is a little bit high, depends on the volume of it, but the range of ranging from 36 cents 
to $547. So that's a pretty big, hefty tag if you want to look at it. Business interruption. This one, you don't hear about it until you really hear about it. So <laughs> um, in general, this is kind of what put cyber insurance sort of on the map in the sense that for a long time, before 2017, nobody cared about cyber insurance. And then the not the wanna cry hit, and then the not petra hit, hit, and that's when they were like, oh, we need cyber insurance. But then we don't hear a lot about it because um, most of the company, when they have interruptions, they don't really have to disclose that they had an interruption. Or if they do have to disclose, it's because it's really big. So it's either all or nothing. And then, of course, the latest one is the Cloud Strike one um, due to software bugs. And that is also uh, the estimates right now are saying uh, one and a half to about 5.4. I think 5.4 is a little high, but still, um, we'll see. Um, this is excluding event from ransomware. This is in general business interruption. So I'll talk about what's different kind of business interruptions. So there's the security failures and software failures and so forth. And the first one, in general, the business interrupt, your cyber policy will cover your network business interruption, security failure, malicious hacking, DDoS, those kind of stuff it will cover. The second one is business interruption due to system failures. And system could be software as well. And by default, the Marsh policy language does include this one. But um, if you look at other policies, you want to make sure that is in there as well. So the software bug that CloudStrike was talking about, it's a software bug in the third party software used by you. And a lot of our client that is covered in our cyber policy, but not necessarily always the case. So this is things that, you know, um, you do have to pay attention to some of this. And then there's the contingent business interruption. So anything by a third party provider. And of course, again, look at your policy language. There are IT providers, there's non IT providers for those as well, too. So be, be careful of the last two whether it just cover the IT provider or it doesn't cover the non-IT providers. So the things that I want to point out to everybody to talk about, what is to look out for when you have business interruptions. So additional risk area to consider for business interruption, it's here's the number. 60% uh, of the organization have 1,000, more than 1,000 third party partners. That's a huge number. And then more than half, 73% of them have experienced significant disruptions caused by a third party, whether it's data breach, whether it's, uh, whatever things they have. So don't think third party is not a big one. Of course, you all know supply chains, all the common interdependency of softwares and hardwares and, and you store things in the clouds and what are those include if you talk about sales, you know, loss of critical suppliers, uh, like we have, you know, one supplier for the chip for NVIDIA, for example, Taiwan, semiconductor, those kind of things. So um, supplier dependence. Uh, I don't want to get into the geographic political risk, but I think that is one. And that's starting to come up more about the war, ex declare and non-declare war exclusions in the policies. And of course, use of AIs uh, and the infrastructure that powers AIs. So what if the infrastructure have issues? What are, how and what's going to happen to it? Uh, there's access risk. There's various type of plug-in designs, uh, those kind of things. Uh, and also a lot of the data risk. Uh, this is actually data risk is one of the big things that we're very concerned about. It's that what if they hacked in your data that trains your model? And if you were a healthcare provider, if that data has been tampered with, what would you come up with? Um, and, and what if that's something that went wrong, what would happen after that? So that's part of it. And also the, the hackers, the bad guys, are also using Gen AI in cyber crimes and stuff like that. They also offer chatbots with guarantee privacies and, and, 
and anonymity. <laughs> and those bots are specifically trained on malicious data, including source codes, method techniques, and other criminal strategies. So it's a race of time on AI on how to manage this one. And then, of course, there's a different kind of thing called the operational technology. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. We hear a lot more mostly about IT, and IT and OT is a little bit different. OT is stuff like the SCADA system, the things that manage your um, water supply to say, uh, you know, pipelines and utilities and powers. Uh, most of those systems is 20, 30 years old systems. <laughs> Lots of vulnerabilities. Um, patching, you can't really just say, oh, weekend patching and shut down everybody's electricity. It doesn't work that way. So it's a very opportunistic. And whereas before, if you look at IT, there's only set amount of protocols. But on OT side, there are hundreds and hundreds of different type of protocol. Even the dolphin tank at the, one of the hotel here, it's, you know, at one point it was still SNMP protocol. I don't know what they have changed it now, but that's how they control the temperature of the tank. So um, in, in OT risk also too, when it goes down, it takes a while to come back up. And that's not something that, um, so oftentimes we see IT is connected with the OT and there's different ports that in the OT side gets open. And then once that get open, we always see things that goes wrong. So, so here's some of the larger business interruption event. Um, we can see. Uh, this is updated based on the dollar amount as well as time. I try to keep everything from 2017, but I think I cut one that's 2014 here. So, Last thing, but not last pair I'm going to talk about is ransomware. Um, so ransomware, I have data set about 40,000 events. And only the event that intended to extract ransom, we call it ransomware. So like a not Petya, I count that as a BI because they're not really there to extract ransom. They're there to, to cause disruption. So some of the large ransomware losses that we see, uh, manufacturing, if you look at the numbers, this is a lot smaller co in comparison. So one of the things that's interesting about this peril is that in the terms of tail, this is a lot shorter tail, recovery a lot faster compared to privacy breach, compared to a uh, business interruption event. So not to say this is not a bad thing, but um, this, is a, this is still a peril that's increasing in frequency and there's increasing also starting to trying to get your data so that they, they can more, be more effective in extracting the ransom. So if you look at the frequency year by year, uh, you can see on the top chart, 2019 is a little bitty, and I didn't put, bother to put 2018 on. I actually ran a time series at one point, and there's definitely a break point between 2018 and 2019. So 2019 was the starting of the really bad ransomware stuff, ransomware as a service. Now if you look at 2023, it goes up much higher. In 2024, there's still more, but if you do it by quarter, that's what it looked like on the bottom chart. Um, total known loss by year. So 2021 looks like a very bad year, but again, this is also just what's known. There's a lot more to it than this. So we can see there's, um, this is just by year. You can see that it's up and down depending on the year. But uh, if you look at the frequency wise, uh, 2021 was high, but 2023 is still quite high. <clears throat> but one thing we do see, the trend is, this is va validated by multiple um, data source. Uh, of those who decide to pay, not pay, from the data we have, it's dropped down to about 22% on 2023. And if you look at Coware's data, they're dropped down to about 28%. Um, so. It started on well, 2019, it was about 60 some percent. It's gone down to about 22% from our data that we have. So 
A lot more company are got having better control now. They better back up, better, you know, way of recovering, preparing for it, practicing if that happens. Uh, so they can refuse to pay ransom. We do see that as a trend. Uh, in terms of bridge response costs from 2019 to 2023 of the data, the average also kind of go the same thing, still one million. <laughs> this doesn't change a whole lot. The median bridge costs about constant, pretty much. Um, the tail, uh, it gone up to on the tail because there's few large, very large event on 2020, 2023. So Q3 of 2023 was a bad time wise. And here's the demand versus payments. If you look at the medians of this, um, of the little horizontal bar, the little horizontal bar, this is the actual pay, ransom pay. And you go year by year, it's increasing in 2019 to 2020. 2020 to 2021, pretty much just stay the same. Didn't change, maybe lower a little. 2022, it went down a lot, but 2023 went back up again. And the largest ransom demand on this list was $175 million demand. So yeah, that's in 2023. So the, that's this data point. Thank you, it show, no, it doesn't show it. Ah. The PowerPoint shows it, but on the presentation mode, it doesn't show it. So, um, so just to get, get an idea, the ransom demands kind of go the same route as well. 2021 is flat. 2022 is almost the same, 2093 went back up. Um, here's ransom pay. So the median of our data from 2019 through 2023, it's uh, for 2023 is a lot lower compared to 2021. Look at the median in 2021. Uh, it's, quite, it's about 5 million, that's the median, that's really high. And then was moving on to uh, average. The average here is the data average. All the others are percentile, so we don't want to actually tell you what they actually pay. So I did a log normal distribution and give it the percentiles to get what the range are. So, so how do you improve your odds um, using our research? Well, for ransomware, be mindful of your electronic communication. If they're in your environment, they know exactly what you have in there. They, if you send the policy back and forth, we've seen it, they actually know exactly what your policy limit is. And they say, okay, negotiate all you want, we know what your policy is. So um, this is kind of uh, things that we are seeing. Uh, also, don't contact the threat actor directly. Uh, talk to legal about uh, what are the laws, the notifications that you have to have. Uh, there's a thing called the OFAC of, uh, requirements. Make sure you don't do business with North Korea's or other sanctioned countries. And you have to make a decision whether you pay or not pay, and then understand and involve your insurer, and also keep all your records and stuff like that. And track data recoveries and restoration costs. All of those need to be tracked. The next one, this is just a to-do list. Uh, I'm not going to go through every one of them. This is a good to-do list before you have to, uh, you, this is something before any incident happened, including your ransomware event, you wanted to know, uh, you know, what if they demand for something? What if you double this extortion? You should have answer to all of these questions ahead of time. So this is a good checklist that you can have to say, okay, do we have all this stuff? and what kind of public disclosure do we have to have? Who do we need to talk to? Uh, in case there's an incident, who do we call? And who are the sanctioned entities? Can we make a list and do all of that stuff? Just to understand who to get all those informations from. So preparation, preparation, this is what needs to happen. And in case you have to pay a ransom, <laughs> um, I will work very closely with your carriers and then you want to engage the outside counsel and extortion services guys to negotiate. We do see negotiation have gone, came back to very positive results. So they are worth it. Um, they also would provide intelligence to, you know, about the bad guys and what did they do, what did they done in the past. 
and then extend your payment deadlines type stuff. Um, testing the encryption keys that they give back to you, and then OFAC checking, those are all the um, extortion services could provide. And then uh, if you decide to pay, don't pay the bad actor directly. Pay the services guy, let them deal with it. So I think that's it. Uh, and then if you cyber carriers, speaking of cyber carriers, next one's also a list. <clears throat> this is a list, I know there's a lot of words in here, sorry. Uh, but this is meant to be a list of what the insurance company expect you to have when you file claims. So this is ahead of time just to give an idea of what kind of, uh, is it contained? Is it encrypted? How does it impact it? Have you, how many records is breached? Uh, did you get them all out? Did you clean it all up? Did you, is all the stuff yours? That, you know, those kind of stuff, that, the things that they would expect you to have an inventory of it. Um, um, I talked about last year about a top control, and uh, this is one of the control by signal string. So this is a, uh, we did a, when companies come to us for, to get insurance, we make them fill out a questionnaire, it's about several hundred, I don't know, it's quite a few hundred of questions. And talk about their environment, talk about their practice, talk about their training, talk about everything that so here are some of the system uh, questions that you see for the example of those kind of stuff. So we took that and we get a few thousand of those a year. So we took those things, collected those data, and collected the claim information. We correlate it. So we can see the hardening technique has a very strong correlation. If you configuration tools and such as your active directories not set up correctly, that's gonna be, you're gonna, very likely you'll have a claim. So those are the kind of things that we want through the study and the correlations of those strengths. And here still, for 2024, this is still the same 12 cyber control, security controls that we expect our client to have. And filling out the, those questionnaires also too help us assess, you know, what are the area that you're not as strong at and if, improvement could be made, if you made those improvements, then you could po potentially get a better rate and so forth. And be easy to, more company might want to come to you, uh, want to insure you as well. So those are kind of things, this is the list of uh, controls that we still recommend to all of our clients. And if you don't have the top six, a lot of the carrier won't even insure, either won't insure you or charge you arm and leg that you don't want to pay basically. So lesson learned, reduce your data, reduce your risk, uh, store less and delete more, have automated deletions and limited data provided to your suppl suppliers. And uh, uh, there's a, maybe have a, make the supplier have a surface level agreement to have delete data, up to the inventory of your data and classify your data and treat them differently and understand where your data is stored and third parties, third party partners. That I keep going back to supply and third parties. Uh, so plan for zero days. Um, IBM says average cost saving with a cyber event is $2.66 million if you plan for it. Um, so educate your staff. And the last thing was workforce training. So this come from the law firm as well as uh, coalition. Uh, doesn't matter what you do, you gotta train your uh, workforce to understand your risk environment, to understand don't click on stuff that you're not supposed to and don't download stuff you're not going, supposed to go to and don't click on this, don't do that. So anyway, that's the, uh, SANS has a good training class on those things. That's it, questions? I have my email on LinkedIn here. Yes. Check. Thank you, Wendy. Can you uh, share with us why Marsh considers the CrowdStrike outage a zero-day attack? No, it's not. It's a software bug. Right. Okay. So that's 
Now that you clear that up, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So that is insured, by the way. If you have, that's insured under third-party liability, correct? Liability is insured, and it depends on what your language is. In general, if no, it's actually in your cyber policy. The second one. It's the second one on the BI thing. Let me go back to BI. Oh, right there. Oh, yeah, that one. That's the second one. System failure. Software okay. works in third-party software. It's used by you. Okay, great. Thank so you. So by default, the language that we have in our policy paper, we do include those. But some companies, some insurer, depends on where you get your policies and stuff, may not. But you want to make sure that is in there as well. And same as contingent. So if you provide services like a software as a service or environment, a cloud, type of thing, um, you want to make sure that is also included. Great, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Obstacle course. So in, uh, great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, so in your network, um, you know, in your breakdown of which, uh, what are the most common sort of uh, uh, um, in like breakdowns? Uh -huh. One was like a network breakdown, and uh, there was a impersonation. Now, if if a system administrator's credential has been compromised, to then uh, compromise, and uh, yeah, the network breach, right? Yeah. Uh, so, if a system administrator's credential is compromised, is that a network breach or is that an impersonation? It could, it would be it could be a network breach. Okay. This is just what we did was we took all the uh, claim information that we have, and the event description that we have, we classified it. So how did they get in? Is it because of misconfiguration? Is it because of network breach? Is it because of impersonation? If it's because of so any of those kind of description, and then we look at the back end on the other side. What kind of business event did it trigger? Did right. it trigger, you know, uh, extortion? Did it trigger whatever things? That right, happened? right. Yeah. No, I mean, um, because if you're compromising a system administrator's credential, it is actually impersonation. So I was wondering, you know, how you... Close. Yeah, if it's... It's not so clear in the sense... Actually, this one, this is the stuff we actually use a large language model to do the classification okay. for us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And by the way, this is just for retail. I didn't run it for the whole thing. Does Marsh track statistics on um, applications for insurance that Marsh has either deemed uninsurable or that companies have decided that the policy is too restrictive to we afford? We don't track specific applications. We track what industry you're in, how, much rec how many records do you have, what do your control environment look like? And we're trying to get you to do better in your control so you can get a better coverage. Uh, Application-wise, there's so many homegrown applications that you can't track all of them. Cause so, sorry, uh, when I say applications, I mean applying for insurance. So companies that have applied for insurance with Marsh that have been denied a policy or that the policy was so restrictive to cost that a company has decided that they couldn't get into cyber insurance. Usually it's because one of those 12 controls that you guys, saw, right. whoever it is, didn't do. Yeah. But it's not tracked or? It's not tracked okay. in terms of application-wise. Oh, okay. the, in, in terms of application. Like um, number of companies. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't track those. Um, okay. We usually, yeah, we don't track what, what did they, usually it's because of the control, one of those five controls that they didn't do, and when we say, you need to get this done before you apply, right. and they didn't get it done, then the carrier looked at us, uh, uh, we don't want to ensure that. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm on time. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you.